Ja, also. Sehr gut. Very good, thank you. So, next talk here is? I think uh, Stefan, he's wa uh, waiting impatiently. Yeah. There, over there in the corner. He's an economist and he's a member of the Club of Rome. And if you're lucky, he's going to tell a bit about what that is, maybe. And his talk is called Economy in Times of Corona. Give him a warm applause. Yeah. <laughs> wow. I first have to do a disclaimer. You know? I've hardly attended a conference with so many IT nerds so well organized. It's fantastic. And when the organizers called me about half a year ago to attend this conference, uh, I was wondering, why did they invite me to attend this conference? You know, I do not even have a phone. I have no idea what you were talking about in the last hour, what Bob told you. I didn't understand a word. So why did they invite me? So I'm feeling very honored coming to Dresden, coming to you IT nerds who are probably at the cutting edge towards the future, and to talk about something which has, in the first place, just nothing, really nothing to do with IT or software or developing or engineering or something like that. I'm an economist, I'm a member of the Club of Rome and of the Lancet Commission, and we are dealing with sustainability issues. And this is what the organizers told me in the first place. We want speakers coming from outside talking about something which has not a direct impact on your daily work, but provides kind of a helicopter view on what's happening in economics, in very general sense. Let's see. Okay. I'm going to start with six numbers. Because you are the number nerds, I'm going to start with six numbers. And I have a chance to speak about 40 to 45 minutes, and after that, we can go into Q&A, right? 85% is the ratio of private wealth globally compared to the 15% left to the public sector. If we continue business as usual in an economy, there's only 60 harvests left. 60 times farmers can drive out doing harvest and coming back, and then it's over, because the land degradation is probably completely broken. 10, the direct and indirect subsidies for fossil industry is roughly 10 times larger than the one for renewables globally. Every 10 minutes, there's one species being eradicated irreversibly, globally. So at the end of that talk, we're going to have six species less forever. They never come back. And we require about five trillion US dollar extra in order to finance our sustainability goals. You remember sustainability development goals of the UN? The UN met in 2015 and they came up with these nice graphs with all these 17 goals. One of the boards is out there at the coffee shop. And in order to achieve this roadmap of the UN sustainability development goals, we require about five trillion extra liquidity or purchasing power to make that happen. Two, 
we require about 2% of global GDP to tackle global warming. That's a lot of money, but that's not the end of the world. Because you're number nerds, I started with six numbers. You know, when this graph was done, we didn't have a war yet. And I want to go with you through a series of slides with a series of graphs and tables and numbers to explain why beyond the pandemics, beyond the climate, beyond the biodiversity collapse and beyond the war, we are entering a new phase in the way we're living together. And I have six topics I would like to discuss with you. And whenever you feel not really comfortable with the argument, or because it's not your business, because you're doing developing software, what I'm learning, you just raise your hand and just give me a timeout, and then we go into Q&A. I myself am particularly interested in the link and you will see it at the end of the slides, between the link uh, between economics and finance and sustainability. This is my topic. This is why I get up at 2 o'clock in the morning. First, this is a graph that shows you world, uh, the world in data is the best database. If you want to argue with your folks on sustainability issues, they are the most robust and resilient databases. You look up our world in data and you find that over the last 200 years, the CO2 level in the atmosphere has been rising and has been exponentially rising, in particular since 1950. That's an exponential curve, as you know. That's another curve which shows you the other direction also world in data, that demonstrates you the loss of species over the last 60 years. And the third graph is a graph over 100 years showing you the exponential increase of what medical doctors call zoonosis. That's what we've been experiencing within the pandemics, right? An animal, a species, a virus, a bacteria is basically jumping over to the human species and then causing damage. And this has been increasing exponentially. Why do I show you this graph? Actually, I show you these three graphs because I would like to get you a clue that all these so-called crises are probably not crises we're talking about. They're more symptoms that we all, as a society as a whole, are entering a new state of aggregation. It's like water. You know, you, you can have water in a, in a solid form, and then you change the state of aggregation into a fluid form, and then you change it into a vaporous form. And each time you basically each time you basically change the way water is organized. And if you take that metaphor and transfer it into our societal context, each time the way we're living together has been changing. And these three graphs, these three so-called crises I've just showed you in this data, are symptoms for change in our societal aggregation. It could go upwards or downwards. This is where we are at the moment. It could go towards the good or the bad. We don't know. But in any case, it's a nonlinear, chaotic, somewhat exponential rearrangements of the components we are at hand. Second statement. What do you think <clears throat> is the 
as biologists say, the selection advantage of a human being. You know, why we're here, why we made it over the last 50,000 years. Why are we so successful compared to other species? Is it the opposition of the thumb, as we learned in school? Is it the capacity to speak? Animals can speak. Is it the capacity to have emotions? Animals have emotions. Is it the capacity to stand right upward? To use the language? To think? You find that in other species too. So what is it that makes us so extremely successful on this planet? And you know what it is? It is the capacity that we tell each other fictitious stories about something that does not even exist in the real world, but we all believe in. And this belief in these fictitious stories can help us coordinate millions and billions of cohorts of people in one or the other direction. The story about God is such a story. The story about money is such a story. This is at its core the reason why we're so successful. We meet because we believe in something that actually in the real world doesn't exist. We just create it. One of the stories is the story about global poverty. This question has been asked all over the world to all different social classes, different educational systems, different cultures, different states. And you simply ask, what do you think, how did global poverty change over the last 30, 50 years? So, didn't it change at all? Did it increase by 20% or did it decrease? And statistically, statistically, the vast majority of people go for two, B. But it's statistically wrong. It's statistically C. Poverty has decreased by 90%. So we're partly telling us the wrong story. And this is astonishing because it has nothing to do whether you have a PhD in IT or in economics, whether you have an academic training at all. If you have chimpanzees doing this, they do better. You know why? Because they just choose 30% C. Chimpanzees do better than us. Why am I showing you this graph? Because this is the stories we're telling each other. Don't worry, don't, don't download that stuff and don't even go into the figures. You can have the graph afterwards. The reason why I showed you this graph is just look at the red graphs. They're all more or less exponential in one way or another. They're coming, this one is coming from the British Royal Society of science, and they demonstrate all the negative stories, all the negative narratives, like foreign direct investment, CO2 concentration, major floodings, the amount of McDonald restaurants, paper consumption, coastal zone structure damage. You can measure that. You can really kind of scientifically pin that down. And what do you see? They're all exponential in one way, like the first three graphs I've showed you. And they roughly all started about 75 years ago, roughly, globally. These are the stories we're exposed to. These are the narratives we're telling each other. But you can also come up with the opposite stories. These are the good stories. These are the positive narratives. The oil spillovers exponentially decreased over the last 
50 years. The children dying decreased from 44 to 4 percent. Women's right voting increased by 193 percent, etc., etc., etc. So again, it's the story we're telling each other that determine the outcome whether we're going to be successful or not. This is just one out of the other graphs I've just showed you. And the reason why I'm showing you this graph is keep this graph in mind because I'm going to get back to this graph again. On one side, on the horizontal side, you see the years. It's basically a 300, uh, 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 250 uh, years timeline. On the other side, you see a CO2 emission by world regions. And what you see again, there is an exponential growth built in here. And we actually have surpassed an overshot. If you're honest to each other, we've overshot the planetary boundaries on CO2 already. This era we we're talking about here from an environmental perspective, from a economic perspective, from a sociological perspective. It's called the era of the Anthropocene. This is a term from Paul Krusen. Paul Krusen was a Nobel Prize winner in the early 2000s in his atmospheric chemistry findings. And he coined that term. And he meant first time in Earth history, it's been the human species that determines causally the state of the planet. CO2, waste, land degradation, species losses, and 100 others. And in this area of the Anthropocene, things get unclear. They get uncertain. And you experts in IT know the difference between, you know the difference between uncertainty and risk. A risk can be quantified. Okay, you can put a tag on it. An uncertainty you cannot. An uncertainty is, a, is something you cannot really deal with because it's part of the system. And this Anthropocene area is characterized by real-time interconnectedness. Everything we're doing right now is affecting anybody else anywhere else in the world, causing major feedback loops back into us, into our system where you reach tipping points where the entire system goes on autopilot, operating within planetary boundaries where there's permanent overshots. And we create exponential so-called accelerations. In 1950, we call it great accelerations. Yep, this is three weeks old. This graph is an update from the Stockholm uh, Stockholm Institute for Resilience, and I want just to point out this part of it. Novel entity, this is new. The other stuff is old, this is new. We can quantify the planetary boundaries now. If we stay within the boundaries, it's going to be fine. That's the green zone. Uh, the yellow zone, orange zone, is not good. And with regard to novel chemistry entities, we've been oversteering the system already by far. Anthropocenes, we are reading tipping points. A tipping point is something where things look like pretty good to begin with. They look linear, but they are exponential, and then you need a point from which onwards you can't control the situation anymore. The Amazon is such a tipping point, you know? Researchers have shown that the Amazon is reaching a tipping point with regard to our global climate with about 25% being harvested. So if we destroy 25% of the Amazon, it's over. Not going to come back. 
in the next five million years or whatever. So it's over for us. And we've reached already 17%. That's a tipping point. It's a nonlinear, chaotic tipping point. So how are we dealing with this? Are we dealing with this with more apocalypsis, with more alarmism, with more anxiety? Or can we create new incentives and new forms of adapting towards this new era of the Anthropocene? You know, when you went to school, you probably heard the term and the name Malthus, right? This was the guy who said there's a link between population growth and food production. And what you see here is a, is a this is 2,000 years here, and this is uh, capital accumulation. And what you see here over a period of about 1,500 years, there have been ongoing so-called multi-cycles. Population up, harvest down, harvest down, population down, etc., 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 etc. Over and over and over and over again. 1,500, 2,000 years. With regard to creating wealth and welfare, with regard to creating capital and the future, something substantially happened during this period here, between 1715 and 8050. Suddenly, people globally were able to accumulate capital over and over again. This is where we are right now. And this was associated with an order of freedom, human rights, property, free market, educational systems, and so forth. Free trading, free research, universities. And if you take the same graph and kind of crush it, the same graph, this is where we are right now. And there's three options. We go into another multi cycle over the next thousand years, up and down and up and down and up and down, very, very cursing, painful, people going up, harvest going down, etc. Or the whole system gonna crash. Or we consider that we are that generation here. It's kind of enlightenment 2.0. Or if you look at it from a larger perspective, historical perspective, a renaissance 2.0. How does that look like to go this way and not that way and not going in this way? This graph shows you a 100-year period, and the amount of people dying in absolute terms because of natural disasters. Okay, over the last 100 years, there have been ongoing natural disasters in Germany. The Ahrtal one was one of them. They're happening over and over again. They're partly even increasing. And these researchers try to find out how many people actually died in absolute terms because of natural disasters. And in 1920, about 500,000 people died per decade. And what do you see here? This is robust data. Okay, this wasn't done by my backup office, right? This is robust data, peer-reviewed. What you see is an exponential growth of going all the way down to this year, and we have now about 20,000 people only dying because of natural disasters. Why so? Just imagine this is an absolute, absolute data. This is not even relative data. The amount of people dying from natural disaster decreased by 95% over 100 years. And if you put that in relation to the increase of population by factor four over the last period, you end up even with the adaption capacity of 99%. So if you were born in 1920, compared to now, you have now 
a 99% chance, higher chance to survive. This is something. You can compare this, this is the same data, just in the in infograph. If you can compare this downshift with the capital accumulation over the same period, what you see is they're inversely correlated to each other. The more we were able to grow in an intelligent way, in a smart way, we save lives and get more healthy at the same time. You remember I showed you this graph now the third time? This is the graph about the CO2 load over 250 years, and here are the billions, again, world in data. I want you just to look at this part of the graphs. This is 1970, this is the US, this is Europe, others, this is Europe 28. You know, here in 1970, the elder among you might remember 1972. In 1972, just 50 years ago, the Club of Rome published Limits to Growth, where it demonstrated if you continue in a business as usual scenario, we will have severe problems within the next 70 to 100 years. Mainly causing a collapse of the ecosystems. Just look at these two graphs. And research have shown that for the United States, for example, the same is true for Europe and the EU 28, the real consumption of metals like aluminum, nickel, copper, steel, gold, from that period of time has decoupled from the GDP in relative terms and in part also in absolute terms. It's astonishing. Nobody really talks about that, especially if it comes to the US. And the same is true for the total energy consumption, right? Total energy consumption. It's plateauing here. Real GDP is increasing. This is not true for the rest of the world. They're catching up. But this is true for these two regions called OECD countries. The rich countries have found mechanisms to detach from resource consumption in absolute and relative terms. However, on a too high level. I would like to repeat that because it's important for our debate. However, on a too high level. Because the rest of the world, if they want to catch up, we are basically getting into these overshots and these planetary boundaries. We cannot basically frame in our entire economy. <clears throat> So what are we going to do? Look at this graph. What do you think? Look at these two pictures, the Panama Canal and a forest monoculture, the Gandhi Delta and the rainforest. What do you think which of these two piles these two or these two, which is the most sustainable? Research on that question can answer this in so-called systems theory and complex theory modeling. And they basically come up with this or a very similar graph. By the way, if you need references, you know, just send me an email, I send you the file and all the reference. I don't want to make an academic lecture, it's a popular lecture, so you can get back to me on that. So what you see is, this is the amount of sustainability of a system. And sustainability reflects long-termism. Like, the Amazons last for hundreds and thousands and millions of years. The Panama Canal, 50 years. This pine tree monoculture, 10 years. And the Ganges Delta, also millions and millions of years. Okay? And you have basically, you can boil down the entire debate on sustainability on two major factors. 
Meaning, if you want to have a system being sustainable, at its core, it's enough to look at two variables. And one is the amount of efficiency of the system. And efficiency basically reflects streamlining or throughput per time. This is what we talk about in economics, about global value chains, just in time, etc. This is where we hear maximum efficiency. We can do the opposite and do a maximum resilience. Then we hear the system is very resilient, and resilient means it is able to uh, cope with shocks by being diverse as much and interconnected as much. Remember this talk, uh, this picture about the uh, the gang, the gang, uh, the Ganges? was very diverse and interconnected, like the Amazon forest, very diverse, interconnected. But if you want to do it smart, you have to come up with an optimum between the two. Too much efficiency is not good. Too much resilience is not good either. So how should economics look like in times of the corona, in times of the Anthropocene, in times of these asymmetric shocks ahead of us. We need completely different types of risk assessment. We need completely different types of how we organize our economy, which means we probably entering a, a phase where in part, not in all parts, but in part, we have to re-regionalize our value chains. We have to learn to reduce our wealth standards where we learn that less is more. We have to learn that agriculture has not to be a monoculture, which is efficient, but rather regenerative, where biodiversity, bioproducts, and humus uh, 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 restoration becomes relevant. We're learning that economics have to happen within the right balance of efficiency and resilience itself. And we're going to learn that there will be new rules, new rules of what's going to be common, a public good, and what is a private property. And finally, it's about reshaping, which means basically what we all can do here in the hall, eating a veggie burger, or riding a bike, or staying at home instead of taking a plane. All these seven rules are going to apply in one way or another if you want to cope with the challenges of the Anthropocene. And the organizers asked me to use at least five or ten minutes at the end of my talk to speak on how we are going to finance all that. You know, uh, I'm running several international working groups on that specific question. And I'm pretty aware that you are not experts in financial engineering and assets and banking and central banks and all that stuff. So I would like to get you acquainted and familiar with the following. Look, this is our value chain here. Okay, that's what we're doing. There's central bankers, commercial banking system, and then we do something. For example, we develop a software program. We build a tank. We produce, manufacture a bike. Or be farmers, or educators, or professors. And at the end of that pipeline, we basically tax and fee this value chain and use parts of that money to finance our sustainability goals. Economists call it end of pipe finance. So we do whatever we already used to do, and in the end of that pipeline, we fee it and we tax it and use that money to finance sustainability. And in parallel, you have what economists call a shadow economy. 
about a third of the entire world economy is not happening illicit, but uh, not happening transparent, but illicit. It's happening in the shade. And this part is pulling the entire world economy in the wrong direction. We want to go there. This is the future for us and our kids. Not there and not there. Okay? The point is, now it's getting a little bit tricky macroeconomically. Everything you're doing within that value chain here, right? Whatever you're doing, developing something or manufacturing something or lifestyle changes or producing or trading, or whatever, it still depends to 78% on the fossil industry. That's what we're currently experiencing with the food and energy price uh, inflation here in Europe. And we're experiencing that this pathway is growing globally with about two, three, four percent. And anytime you create a windmill at the end here, or a solar panel, or doing good, you basically feed back with your income, with your investment, exactly in that value chain, and economists call it the multiplier, by factor 1.8 to 2.0, which basically stabilized the entire system here. And this is one of the major reasons coming from the financial sector why the first three graphs I showed you, the exponential growth of the CO2, the loss of the species, the zoonosis, and basically all major other biophysical data have not really changed because we add a windmill right there and it feeds back into the system. This is very expensive, very, very expensive for mine and your generation over the next 20, 30 years if we don't accelerate a change. And the change is, as, as of me and as from our working group, primarily has to come also from the financial sector. Remember I showed you this graph where we say the optimum for a sustainability future is between resilience and efficiency? And we're saying the optimum is right there so it's in the middle, but if you zoom in, it's actually not exactly in the middle. It's two-third bend towards resilience and only one-third towards efficiency. And what we're doing right now, we are, have a monetary monoculture, that's what it's called, where we basically crash again and again and again and then collapse and have crisis and work ourselves all the way up here, and then we have a monoculture that crashes again and collapses. This is the cycle we're in, over and over and over and over again. We can do better. And this is now the link to your business, because you are IT guys, IT nerds. Why it is affecting your business. I show you. Look at this green graph here. There is enough empirical evidence now that in at least two fields in the financial sector, something is happening that never happened the last 500 years. And one is directly affecting your community, your IT community. It's basically, one is private cryptocurrencies. They have a market capitalization of about 5 trillion already, 5,000 billion globally. But it's a private currency, and it's a private currency running in parallel to the given value chain. And the second debate is something you're going to have the next months and years, and you will recall this talk by simply remembering this abbreviation, CBDC, Central Bank Digital Currencies. 89 central banks are experimenting and operating already with another currency. China is doing it already. 
Europe is doing it already, 89%, reflecting about 92% of the world GDP, are operating and experimenting with this form of currency, which is a public currency, whereas the cryptos are a private currency. And if I had another hour, I think I would be able to explain to you why this approach, by introducing a monetary ecoculture, whether crypto and or public, done in the right way, using distributive ledger technology, DLT, with smart contracts, would enable us as a world community to generate additional liquidity and channel that money through different monetary channels towards SDGs. And then we would not end up with an optimum here. We would end up shifting the entire curve higher and more towards resilience. Because we have less efficiency and more resilience. I'm aware that you are not experts in finance. It doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. And what I would like to sum here, for all of us, we're now living in a new era called the Anthropocene. And we have to be very careful about the narrative we're telling each other. For me, it's a narrative that is less of a crisis, but more an emergence of a new state of societal aggregation. And this requires a new balance between efficiency and resilience, and this has at its core, as the main accelerator, or as the main catalyzer, an adapted, upgraded monetary financial regime. First time where finance doesn't drive sustainability, but the reverse. Sustainability is driving finance. And I published a lot on that stuff. I can read and Google my stuff, but you shouldn't actually read it because uh, that's for the finance nerds. But you should read this book. And you know what's really astonishing? Kim Stanley Robinson is a world best-sell author in fiction novels. He writes fiction stories about the future. And this was a best-selling fiction novel about a ministry for the future, sold in all over the world in 20 languages. And I got called up by my family saying, hey, Steve, did you read Stan Robinson? I said, no, I don't have time to read fiction stuff. They are explaining in that, he's explaining in that book exactly the same mechanism you're exploring with your working group over the same period of time, published in the same month of the year with scientific evidence. It's the first time where science fiction meets scientific evidence, where fiction meets facts. This is what I found super exciting for me, because I'm not an IT nerd, but I'm a fintech nerd. And I might like to thank you very much for your attention, and I'm looking forward for interesting Q&As. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Stefan. Does it, does it fit time-wise? Perfect. Oh, wow. Just perfect. Okay. Very good. good. What an interesting you. story you told. Yes, I find it fascinating. You know, when you are uh, a science nerd and you do your stuff over and over again, and suddenly uh, a, a fiction writer comes to the same conclusion, this is really fascinating, isn't it? Absolutely. <laughs> 
absolutely. <laughs> yeah, anyway. It's very good. Yeah. And uh, I, I also liked, um, I like many parts. Uh -huh. That's a topic of interest for me. And um, what I liked is uh, what I told about how uh, the Anthropocene and the humans are actually so much different in ah. creating stories, let's yeah. say, uh, creating yeah. fictitious stories. And it's very interesting. And um, we, ha we have actually a question, don't yes. we? Yes. Okay, go ahead. We, what do you see what we as tech eco ecosystem can do for sustainability? What you can do for sustainability? Yes. You can do a lot. I mean, personally, you can reshape your lifestyle. Eh? Drive a bike, etc. This is what you do on an individual level. What you can do on a sector level, meaning your sector of IT, right? You can support fintech and you can support these form of monetary regimes that enable sustainability by working on increasing the efficiency of blockchain technology. Because blockchain technology is still relatively slow and highly energy consumptive. And it's been four weeks ago that MIT came up with a new algorithm that enables central banks to allow 1.4 million transactions per second. This is five times more than Visa is doing already right now. So we need your expertise because, you know, when I listen to Bob's lecture and I went to all these meetings out there, you know, I have no idea what you're doing. It's far too complex for me, far too complicated. So we need your brain. We need your expertise. You have to lean in for this common future. Yeah. Thank you. And I think... Um, the same applies to us. Uh, this is a complex subject that you are talking about, and I uh -huh. think what you achieved is to bring it to a level where everyone could understand what happens. And this what was actually, the goal. Yeah, <laughs> perfect. I, I really liked it. Yeah, okay. Do we have any more questions? Here? Uh, no, actually not. There was uh, one question. One question. It wasn't actually a question, just uh, a comment. That it was a great talk, and thank you. Yes. And I think we would like to say thank you to you as well for joining this conference with a completely different topic, very well presented and very well understood. We have still a little present for you. I'll fetch it. Yeah. And I would like to thank you for, for the invitation. And please don't hesitate to contact me out there at the coffee break and get back to me. Uh, we are living in exciting times and we all need you guys on board. So, and uh, Stefan, <laughs> I think you can say something. Oh, yeah, that, that's uh, just a little present from uh, the uh, organizing gin. team. That's uh, gin, a gin from oh, Kolbomo wow. Bavaria. You're a Bavarian? Yes, uh, yes. Sponsored by Tech Division, and every speaker <laughs> gets one. So, um, have fun with that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me at your show. I'm looking forward for a common future. Thank you, Stefan. <laughs> And uh, again, we are still behind schedule, I think. I, I would say we decelerated a bit. <laughs> uh, so uh, next talk will be at 12.30 at this stage. It's already updated in here, and yes. it's going to be updated in the app. Um, we have some more questions from the audience regarding the um, talks before. We're going to answer them at the beginning of the talk. So please be here at 12.30 again. Uh, and... Don't forget to rate the talk. Yeah, please rate it. Please it was a great use talk. the app and rate the last talk. So, have a nice break. And I we think have we have some more music. Yes, we yeah. will have some more music. So, please go ahead, enjoy. <laughs>